Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone tuning in from around the world. Welcome to the Phil Camp Investor Ask Me Anything event. I am Rachel Jacob, Program Manager at CelloCamp, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. CelloCamp is an eight-week incubator program where designers, builders, dreamers, and doers come together to build an open financial system that creates conditions of prosperity for all. We have a really exciting event planned for you today, and I'd like to begin by turning it over to Sochi Casador and our speakers for today's session. Thank you, Hi, Rachel. Hi. Hey, everyone. We're really excited about the session this morning. Um, I'm a partner at C-Labs where I lead the Cello Foundation Grant Program. The goal of the Cello Foundation Grant Program is to invest and support in projects that further Cello's mission of building an open financial system that creates conditions of prosperity for all. I'm really excited to be joined up here by our speakers today who will provide more insight into the fundraising process. They're leaders that are at the intersection of crypto and venture capital. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to our panelists to introduce themselves. Pass it over to Ben. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ben. I work at Polychain, um, and uh, specifically, I help to run the Cello ecosystem fund there. Um, so I work closely with Sochi and uh, a couple other members of the um, Cello team to <clears throat> um, basically help find and uh, expand uh, teams that are building on Cello or that are leveraging the Cello tech stack. Um, you know, building novel new technologies, products, uh, and expanding the use cases for cello and cryptocurrencies uh, around the world. Um, that's a small part of what I do at Polychain, but um, it's the main focus of what I'm doing here. So happy to talk about that further as we go forward. Great. Thank you, Ben. All right. Um, Ian, would you like to take it away? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Ian. I'm uh, one of the managing directors here at IDEO. Uh, that's running our crypto fund. Um, we've been in the crypto space for about five years. And what we do is we invest in early stage uh, crypto startups, but we also help incubate them, which is really what's I what IDEO is known for for the last 40 years as a global design and innovation firm. I guess it's also relevant that um, IDEO has a lot of partnerships with enterprises and other global organizations around the world um, that are uh, focused on the same kinds of issues and problems that Celo and its ecosystem are also um, really focused on. So specifically around financial inclusion, we have long-term partnerships with folks like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, focused on markets like India, Southeast Asia, Africa, and places all over the world to try to help bring more and more people uh, into the formal banking system and help um, them in their lives through new digital financial solutions. So um, our team partners with them uh, really closely as well as a number of others across IDEO. Awesome. Thanks, Ian. Ariana, should we try again? Let's see. 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 Hmm. Um okay. Why don't we perhaps um Rachel, do you want to try and like troubleshoot with Ariana offline? We can get started with the rest. Does that work? All right, cool. Thank you. Um, so, um, as Ariana um, is sorting out some of the audio challenges, wanted to call everybody's attention to polls that we have um, at the bottom of your, your screen. You'll see a polls tab. Um, we're trying to get a gauge of where everyone is in their entre entrepreneurial journey. So we know that some folks are just starting the fundraising process for the first time. Others um, have perhaps done this in the Web 2 world, but are new to Web 3. Um, so wanted to get a sense for where everyone is. If everybody can take a second to, um, to, uh, to complete the poll at the bottom, that would be great. So really amazing to see some of the responses. It looks like the majority of the audience has built solutions on other blockchain platforms, but new to Celo. Um, most members of the audience are looking to fundraise in the next three months. And then we have a good cross section of experience with, um, with fundraising. All right, so it's really great to see where everyone is. I'd like to actually get started by asking our panelists a few questions and then we'll turn it over to you um, so that you can uh, speak directly with, uh, with some of our panelists. So why don't we get started? Um, 
Uh, ben, um, as you think about the, the landscape of crypto, what are some of the projects that you're most excited about? Yeah, um, I love this question because there's always sort of like the immediate answer of um, what's happening right now in crypto that where all the hype is. Uh, and then there's sort of like the longer term answer, which I think ultimately is maybe more interesting, um, but always sort of harder to define. So um, right now, obviously, uh, DeFi is like scorching hot again. Everybody wants to build um, DeFi projects. Everybody wants to talk about new um, you know, financial products that are being built and maintained in decentralized ways. Um, I think, you know, the space is learning a lot about DeFi right now. Um, I think we're starting to see that um, capital formation and capital structures in decentralized uh, landscapes just behave very differently. Um, and they don't necessarily have defensibility or moats in the way that traditional capital structures do, or even in the way that layer one blockchains do, right? Um, so when you can sort of um, copy and paste the open source co code from a contract and tinker with the token distribution mechanics and redeploy it 48 hours after the initial contract is launched, um, or even before uh, the sort of original contract launches in some cases, um, what you have is a completely different uh, landscape in which to um, both develop and maintain uh, decentralized products, but also um, try to retain users, right? The stickiness is no longer there. Um, there are some like quote unquote brands like Maker and Compound who um, I think by virtue of being such early entrants to the space have managed to kind of maintain um, some of their, uh, their, their users. Um, but really like the real king now is, is liquidity and um, increasingly that's becoming a function of uh, like liquidity mining token structures. Um, so that's obviously something that we've been paying very close attention to, um, thinking a lot about. It also raises some really interesting questions around which of those protocols are investable, right? Because again, um, if it's so easy to do these kind of vampire forks uh, and liquidity pools are constantly shifting around and really privileging the earliest and largest entrance into these new liquidity pools. Um, that's a very difficult landscape in which to make a, you know, uh, a traditional sort of five year um, venture bet, but even like a six month bet on some of these tokens becomes very difficult to reason about. Um, so that's something that we're thinking a lot about, obviously keeping a, an eye on that space very closely. We've invested in a number of DeFi projects. Um, so, you know, that's always very interesting. Um, I would say the longer term answer for us uh, is, you know, we're always sort of looking for um, technologies that really are pushing the envelope in terms of what was previously possible. Um, the most interesting uh, technologies and products for us are ones that are uniquely enabled by um, cryptocurrencies and, you know, um, cryptographically secured decentralized systems, uh, products and technologies that were not possible um, and couldn't really even have been reasoned about um, until cryptocurrencies were invented, you know, that the, 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 the traditional Web2 tech stack just did not uh, provide the basis for. So um, that's maybe a little bit vague and hand wavy, but it's that's like really where um, I think we shine and, and what really gets our gears turning. Awesome. Um, Ariana, should we try? Let's see your audio. All right, let's see, is that better? Success, yes. All right. Okay, great. Still some echo, but hopefully not too bad. Um, so I have been in the crypto space since early 2013. I initially fell down the rabbit hole as a result of a trip around Southern Africa. I spent time in six countries there, including Zimbabwe, and uh, really got to see the unfortunate aftermath of the hyperinflation that they experienced there. And so when I get, came back to the US, Sorry, it's hard to, with the echo. <laughs> um, when I came back to the US, I was thinking a lot about monetary policy and a friend of mine introduced me to Bitcoin. So that sparked my interest and I ended up leaving Facebook where I, I was working at the time and uh, ended up moving out to the Bay Area and joined a company called BitGo um, and have been in the space um, investing full time for the last five years, first through my own fund, um, which is how I, came to invest in Celo for the first time. And then more recently at Andreessen Horowitz on the crypto, on the crypto team. Um, and obviously we're big investors in Celo's as well. 
Awesome. We were just um, just talking about um, this, the crypto space in general, and just um, what some of the projects are um, that excite you most. So I'll turn it over to Ian to give you a, a breath, um, and then we'll circle back. So Ian would love to hear kind of your perspective is from an IDEO VC um, uh, angle. What are some of the projects that you're most excited about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the lens that we take is is very much informed by how IDEO generally sort of approaches um, problem solving, which is starting with human needs actually first. And those human needs can be either existing or emergent. Um, and emergent meaning with the introduction of new technologies, new capabilities, new trends or whatever, those often lead to <clears throat> new things that people uh, need that they didn't know that they needed before. And so um, through our research and work and investing more recently, you know, we think of uh, three categories that we've been investing in. And this is where our 30 portfolio companies kind of fit in. So first is what we call Web3 infrastructure, which is re-architecting the internet. There's a lot of opportunity there, obviously, like a lot of the layer ones, in our opinion, kind of fit in that category. So um, Web3 uh, infrastructure and tools is the first category. The second one we call open financial systems, which is really about taking the financial system and making it open, equitable, free, and available for people all over the world. So DeFi is actually a sub-vertical um, within that. Actually, about a third of our uh, investments are in the DeFi space, um, which is really interesting, especially given what Ben was talking about with all these, you know, fast forks and things like that um, that we're observing. We have a pretty strong opinion as to how DeFi protocols actually build defensibility, but um, it is a really wild uh, and rapidly moving space. Um, but we think it's really, really interesting. And um, honestly, like open financial systems and DeFi will probably be one of the uh, top two most impactful areas of crypto and decentralization over the next five to 10 years. And so that's why we're so heavily invested in that area. And then the third part, which um, is a little underdeveloped and a little bit newer, but I'm really excited about it, is what we call the future of work and play, which is how is decentralization going to change the way that people connect, interact, collaborate, consume media, uh, and things like that. And why I think that's so interesting, um, we can talk about, D I could talk about DeFi for, for hours, but why I think the future of work and play is really interesting is that now that you have a lot of these DeFi primitives that are starting to get traction and are starting to build sort of some level of success, what that then enables are really interesting things that are not financial services related in the areas of adjacencies. So specifically, for example, we've started to invest in various platforms, or we've invested in various platforms where it's about actually like things like um, giving workers more equity or giving creators, which are becoming an increasing part of our global economy, more equity and control over the, uh, the IP and like the, you know, the things that they're creating. Or uh, we're starting to see some really interesting things happen in the area of like what I would call micro work but uh, a mashup between micro work, gaming, and also fintech, meaning you can play games in like places like Southeast Asia, earn NFTs, convert those NFTs into assets, and actually even use those assets as collateral to take out a loan in DeFi. That's really weird. Uh, sounds like kind of strange, but you know, in some of these emerging markets where um, you know micro work is a big thing already and has been for for over a decade we think that some of these new uh primitives and some of these new solutions are actually going to take that to the next level so i'm really excited about that area over the next you know three or so years yeah it's, um i think that also is especially relevant given like where we are in the world today with um with the pandemic and with so many people being out of work i think that you know, having access, especially when you're in remote parts of the world to capital and then to also to different forms of like earning um, or different forms of income, I think is like really interesting. There's, um, two, there's two really big problems, by the way, on that. Like one is access to work and we don't have enough work today, which is, I mean, that's, that's, that's a huge problem. So we need to create new forms of work. Um, and the second thing is about equity, which is even if you do, you know, have some work, uh, a lot of people aren't able to build equity 
um, today. And that's that's a problem that um, I, I believe crypto can uniquely help solve. Yeah, talking about truly decentralizing wealth, right? Yeah. Um, Ariana, what are some of the areas that you're most excited about um, in crypto? Yeah, I think it's been a really interesting year to see the launch a number of layer one platforms while also watching the development of the Ethereum ecosystem, particularly a number of layer two solutions that are really focused to um, kind of help things scale. And obviously we're super excited about kind of the parallel tracks of innovation. I think it's likely that we'll see, um, you know, some chains emerge in leaders as leaders in certain categories and others for other categories. Um, so that's been really exciting. Obviously DeFi has taken off. I've had an interest in that category for a while. And I think particularly um, decentralized exchanges, which were often described as something that couldn't possibly work, at least not at scale for 10 plus years. Um, some of them have really started to take off and I find them to be really fascinating math problems. Um, you know, a lot of the AMMs are, are using pretty fascinating, um, you know, it, it, different kinds of mathematical innovation to really solve um, some of their challenges. And so I think it's just a testament to the fact that when you get a lot of really smart developers working on any problem, um, you can solve whatever it is in often a shorter amount of time than was initially anticipated. So it's been really cool to see that. Um, I also think there's some really cool stuff happening in the gaming space, obviously with NFTs, but now we're starting to see other um, kind of approaches to blockchain based games. And I think the initial model was really just like, here's a digital thing, you can own it. That's awesome. But now we're starting to see actual games that are not purely only economic, um, but where you actually have more complex gameplay and things like that. And, um, you know, that's been an interesting area to watch. I think it'll also be a great category to bring more people outside of the sort of crypto native community into the fold because, you know, that tends to be a little bit of a more inclusive category. And so I think we'll, we'll see a lot more folks coming into crypto through some of these game channels as well. Great. Um, so wanted just to shift gears a little bit and put on um, the perspective of someone that actually is is fundraising um, and w was hoping that you could give some perspective in terms of what you look for in, um, in a project and a factor that is uh, a approaching you for the first time. Um, so we can do this popcorn style. Anyone um, that uh, um, would like to jump in. I'll pick on one. Ian, why don't you take it? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I kind of knew you were going to start with me. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, so we're we're a pre-seed seed investor, and so we're often the first um, institutional check-in at a pretty kind of early, I mean, a very, very early stage. So often um, we're investing in one person, two people, you know, three people, um, and then we help them recruit and build their team from there and their product. So I would say that like our lens on this might be um, a little bit uh, um, uh, framed framed by that. You know, for for us, like I think what we're what is mo we're most looking for is obviously like a really strong um, founder with really relevant um, experience, whether that's on the entrepreneurial side or it's actually related to the problem itself. Um, they don't necessarily have to be like a serial entrepreneur. I think the second thing is that they kind of share the way that we think about, um, you know, uh, like talking and finding users, um, from those users, finding what the problems and needs are, and then from those problems and needs, determining what the best product is to build and then iterate on. Um, we call that like our human designer des design sort of approach and design thinking approach. Um, you don't necessarily need to be an IDO or anything like that, but I think there is kind of this mindset that we look for, which we think has proven itself over the past, you know, number of decades, 
in terms of how to introduce a new solution and make that solution get adopted and, and successful. And so we're looking for people kind of with that user-centered, customer-centered sort of mindset, whether you're building a layer one or you're building a DAP on top of it. Um, and then the third thing, and, and in my opinion, like one of the more important things, is a, a really strong opinion on an insight as to why the thing that you're planning to build needs to exist in the world and why people want it. Um, that's one of the things that I think I, I, I wish we would see more is like a stronger opinion. Like a lot of times, you know, we talk to teams where it's like, hey, we're really smart, like check, uh, you know, we're really experienced check, but like, we don't really know what we're building, but we're gonna just go kind of explore this space. And sometimes that's okay, but like, I think what we really want is like an insight and a strong opinion as to like, hey, this is the way the, way the world is going. This is what it should look like. And this is, you know, what we're going to build to go go make that happen um, that other people may not see. And that's that's something that we're always, you know, looking for and trying to listen for when we meet entrepreneurs. That's great. Um, ben, what about from your perspective, Polychain? Yeah, I mean, we um, obviously, you know, from our like incubator program um, is probably the earliest stage that we sort of, you know, invest in, quote unquote, uh, that's obviously very early stage pre-seed, um, you know, one founder, maybe two founders. Uh, but we also participate in larger, you know, later stage rounds, um, pretty much up to Series A so far. And as the space develops, that that likely will also continue to develop. So. Obviously, the calculations being made there are, are very different. But for the really early stage projects, um, you know, I think uh, Ian touched on a lot of it. Um, it really comes down to getting a strong sense of the founders and how they think about what they're building and how they think about the space. Um, we really want to get a sense that, um, you know, they're thinking about the technology and the problem that's being solved in uh, a novel or interesting way. Um, in a way that, uh, for example, <clears throat> you know, like during, during the diligence process, um, you know, founders are going to get asked a lot of difficult questions about um, how they see the future of what they're building and, and the future of the space and the technology and their place in it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I think at that early stage, it's maybe less important that um, they have you know, definitive specific answers to those questions than it is uh, to demonstrate that they have thought about them um, or that they're capable of reasoning about them in um, in interesting ways because obviously things are going to change the space is going to develop the product is going to change over time um, and it should uh, but you know we want um, there's there's sort of a balance between uh, you know being committed to your initial idea um, but also being able to adapt to to changing circumstances um, the other component that I, I think we are increasingly looking for um, that, that is, is really important uh, in crypto and, and really in any other space um, is the ability to operationalize. Um, and I think that, you know, crypto is, is full of really strong technical founders, um, people who have deep backgrounds in systems engineering or, or you know, distrib distributed systems or cryptography or whatever it might be. Um, and those people tend to form the basis of really strong tech teams. Um, but those teams often will suffer if there isn't also somebody to run operations uh, and to really, you know, um, turn the project into a business, into a company um, and do, you know, the marketing and the hiring and the community development and um, business, uh, you know, business development, all that kind of stuff. So um, we're definitely looking for people who are, um, you know, or teams who are able to uh, deliver on both of those fronts um, and to, to, to really kind of like reason through all of the different challenges that come with building and releasing products in the crypto space. Super good point on the operational aspect. Um, I think I was wondering, just given the Polychain Ecosystem Fund, um, if you could talk a little bit about just the importance of traction. I think we see like a wide range of different applicants that come that are interested in the fund. Um, but wanted um, to just open up the dialogue just to kind of share a little bit more about like what specific traction or early results you're looking for. Yeah. yeah, I mean, at these really early stages, I would say traction is not the primary concern. 
Um, we're really looking for ideas at that stages, and we're really looking for founders that we um, that we can come to trust and that we feel are going to execute well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, traction is great if you have it, um, but we don't really expect that at the stage of, you know, a, a sort of pre-seed investment. At the seed stage, you know, sometimes teams will have um, a live product uh, or sort of an MVP. Sometimes they'll just have a beta. Um, sometimes they'll just have demos. Um, and again, like we're really making those evaluations on the strength of the idea um, and the strength of the team and the way that they're willing to engage with us, um, their ability to, again, answer some of the tough questions about, okay, like, you know, we think you've landed on something interesting here. Um, we can imagine the scenarios in which people will use this, but, you know, walk us through how you're going to take this to market. Um, how are you going to communicate about this product uh, to the broader crypto space? Um, and, you know, which segment of the ecosystem are you going to target to sort of build a wedge? And how do you expand from there? And how do you think about um, the strategy, you know, the strategic component of really um, turning something from a live product into uh, a product with a lot of users and a lot of traction. Um, and I think, you know, the, the interesting thing there is that crypto all of a sudden offers all of these new tools um, to, to gain users and to incentivize people to uh, behave in certain ways, right? Like this is fundamentally the basis of any um, crypto system. Uh, a cryptocurrency is, is, you know, kind of at base, um, an incentive mechanism uh, that is, if designed properly, um, encourages people to behave in a specific way and not behave in other ways. Um, and the same can be said for products, you know, built all the way up the stack. We touched on this a little bit earlier when we were talking about DeFi. Um, and I think that's a really powerful thing. Uh, and, and I think founders should be thinking, you know, pretty deeply about um, how to leverage the unique capabilities of cryptocurrencies uh, to incentivize people to come to their platform and use their products. That's great. So we're going to um, shift gears a little bit and turn it over um, to the the audience. Um, you should all see at the bottom of your screen, ask a question. Um, and it looks like we've got a few questions that have already um, uh, been surfaced, but definitely invite you all to to ask again some of your burning questions. It, uh, it looks like one of the questions that kind of risen up to the top is what's the next killer app for blockchain in your eyes? Um, and Ariana, why don't we start with you? Sure. I think we're really excited about financial applications broadly. Obviously, I think um, what Celo is seeking to enable is, is really exciting. And there's a lot of different projects building on Celo, tying into Celo, unrelated to Celo, you know, we're, we're excited about the financial application ecosystem in general. Um, the reason I think that's one of the areas that is not only most exciting, but I think we'll actually see massive adoption before some of the other areas is just that there's so much of a natural incentive towards it. Um, you know, certain applications I think are fascinating and really important, but there is less of a direct financial incentive to use them. For example, identity. Um, you know, I want to be known. I want to exist in the world and have a digital identity, ideally that's portable. But that's a little bit less of an immediate, obvious incentive than like make money for most people. And so, um, you know, I, I think some of those applications will come, but perhaps later. And so what's happening in kind of the trading, um, credit and lending, uh, derivatives, options, all of these interesting financial interactions and products, um, I think it's going to be one of the next areas to really take off. And obviously, we've already seen that to some extent, but it's still fairly crypto native. Um, and I think there's still an enormous amount of, of room for that to grow, obviously. Ian, how about from your perspective, what's something that you think that is killer uh, app that you're um, that will take the space? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I would agree that um, financial services and I actually came from the financial sector. I was the head of blockchain at Citigroup for three years uh, a long time ago. And the financial system is is completely messed up. So like we have decades or more, you know, potentially generations 
of work to do on um, improving that system and and decentralizing it and distributing it. So I still think that DeFi and, and open financial systems are a, a huge, huge area, um, both in developed markets as well as developing ones. Um, I guess if I were to pick something that were outside of DeFi, I've been doing a lot of um, uh, work and uh, talking with a lot of entrepreneurs and investing in a couple companies in what I would broadly consider the social space. Um, I think that social, um, the, the mashup of social plus finance, uh, the mashup of social plus gaming in a crypto context, uh, the mashup of social plus work in a crypto context, um, especially as we talked about where, you know, there's fewer and fewer jobs, less and less equity, less and less control. Um, that area in my mind is probably going to be the next place to break out over the next two years. So I'm, uh, you know, doing a lot of work in, in that area and looking for startups and founders in that area. Very cool. And then. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, this is something that we've been thinking and, and, and talking a lot about. Um, and I think, you know, we're seeing projects launching this year that I think um, are sort of moving in this direction. Um, but uh, I'm really fascinated by the idea of um, layer one networks as being kind of um, these uh, like DAO like capital structures um, where, for example, I think you can think about um, like Polkadot, for example, as a kind of um, fully functioning digital corporation where uh, each parachain starts to look like, um, you know, basically like a like a business unit uh, that sort of benefits from the larger capital and security um, and organizational structure of the overall ecosystem and, and of the parachain. Um, that's one example, but I think that like increasingly, you know, as projects move to uh, more complicated layer ones with built in governance and um, these sort of multi token uh, structures, um, the capabilities for what you can organize within the context of those structures um, and the different kinds of incentive mechanisms that you can build into them is becoming more nuanced. Um, and I think unlocking a lot more potential, right? So even something like Celo, where you have the, um, the, the native stability mechanism and a na native stable coin, uh, as well as a governance function and, um, you know, what is functionally like one-to-one -one EVM support. Um, those are sort of building blocks that in the past would have been spread across a minimum of three different protocols, right? But now you have them all living in the same space. And what it allows for is uh, a much more complex relationship between holders of those tokens and um, products and protocols that will be deployed on top of the cello tech stack, right? So um, for me, like the killer use case, quote unquote, is, is less focused on what's happening up the stack and more focused on like, how are people's relationships to capital structures um, being changed? And, and how do people uh, participate in various governance and value accrual and incentive structures that were not possible in the past. Um, that I think is really what crypto is, is unlocking for us. And, you know, this year has been full of launches um, that again, I think are making meaningful steps in that direction. I think there's a few more that are, um, that are also very interesting that are coming up, but um, you know, I think if you extend that trend out 10, 20 years, um, what you end up with is, uh, I think, a very sci-fi version of the future where um, basically any and all new, you know, quote unquote, corporations begin to uh, exist in fully digital, digitally native formats. Um, and, you know, potentially all of their fundraising and capital allocation and treasury decisions and all their governance decisions, all of that is being handled uh, in a decentralized way with pseudonymous part participants. Um, and is basically being, you know, governed and, and modified over time by these complex um, crypto-enabled incentive structures. 
Very cool. Um, one of the areas, uh, and I see this kind of related to a question that um, has been asked, but I think one of the uh, one of the topics that we often talk about is web two versus web three developers and how do we encourage more web two developers um, into this space? Uh, so someone asked a question about um, what are some of the products and services for DAP developers or protocols that would be of interest? And um, could you give an example of an interesting project um, uh, or untapped opportunity in this space? I think one interesting example is a project called Arweave, which has been building um, a thing called the PermaWeb um, and enabling, uh, well, a lot of things, but really very interestingly, a permanent version of the internet. And I think that's really exciting because in, particularly in countries that have some degree of internet censorship resistance, it basically allows a permanent um, record of the internet, a web page, whatever it is, files, et cetera, um, that is really difficult, if not impossible, to take down. Um, and so that's starting to see some really exciting traction. And I think it feeds very well into the, you know, crypto vision of more open networks in various ways. Obviously, this is not particularly a financial application, so it really falls more into the Web3 file storage and, and open internet category. Um, but I think that's one really fascinating example and um, that's out and live and developers can go and play around with it today. Very cool. Ian, thoughts? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think that there's, there's so much here. Um, and I, I think that um, bringing more web, web two developers in will actually be the, the job of a lot of you as entrepreneurs trying to recruit them and, and convince them that they should uh, leave their, you know, jobs in, in the normal world and, and join this this world. Um, so thank you for doing that. <laughs> as far as like opportunities, um, there's so many that we see on the design and development side in terms of um, building, uh, you know, providing infrastructure, tooling or other things that enable dApps uh, to be built um, better and also um, get them adopted more easily by Web2 users, actually. So the, I guess the way that I would answer that is think about how um, decentralized applications and crypto applications um, look today and, and how are they actually going to attract, attract Web2 users? Because the issues of like, um, you know, private key management, <clears throat> um, disaster recovery, um, like all like identity, all these things that exist in a web two world, but don't like, and, and some of these things, these frictions that web three introduces, like are not things that web two users want to want to deal with. Those are the things that people should build, um, for the web three world that will help us bridge and bring the rest of the world into this ecosystem. Um, so we see, you know, things, whether it's on the developer side in terms of you know, making it much easier for Web2 developers to quickly build smart contracts and deploy them and connect them to Web2 interfaces. There's, you know, a lot there, a lot more that needs to be done. Even on the kind of the Web3 or Web2 side, like, you know, smart wallets, um, you know, key management solutions, things like that, that uh, don't force, you know, your your friend, your, your mother, your grandma to like write down 24, you know, word seed phrases like, those kinds of things, um, I think, are going to um, be really necessary for crypto to realize its full vision for the entire world. Definitely, you hit on some um, some good friction points there. Um, it's a big focus, um, I think, for us as well. Um, ben, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that there are. Um, perhaps unfortunately two really critical parts of this question uh one is what does the space need um and what are we looking for people to build and the second and much more difficult part is um which of those are investable um the real challenge with building tooling in this space is that it's very hard you know you can build something that every protocol after you will end up using as a part of their uh, you know as a part of their tech stack 
Um, but that doesn't mean that it will capture value. It doesn't mean that you will be able to make money on it or the investors will be able to make money on it. Um, that's uh, sort of a sad truth because it means that there's not a lot of incentive uh, to build certain tools that would actually be very valuable to the space. Um, but it, it's a, it is a challenge. Um, and I think it's one that, again, I would encourage people to start to think really creatively about, um, you know, how can we leverage these new incentive structures to drive value uh, to, you know, tooling that's necessary in the space. Um, I think DAOs might actually help to solve some of that, um, especially ones that are contained within specific ecosystems. Um, but as far as the actual tooling that's needed, um, I agree basically with everything that Ariana and Ian have said. Um, I think, you know, one of the big challenges for getting people into the crypto space uh, is that it's still um, both theoretically and practically very complex. It's there are very high barriers to entry. Um, and quite frankly, some of the things that we take for granted as being uh, sort of ideological keystones of the space, something like um, key ownership, for example, or asset ownership, provable asset ownership, um, actually becomes very difficult uh, when you're trying to sell your parents on it, <laughs> you know, um, the idea that you can send a transaction and if you make a mistake, it's completely irreversible and your funds are gone forever uh, is actually not a comforting thing to most people. Um, so finding, you know, tools and, um, you know, design best practices to help abstract away some of that complexity um, and reinforce a sense of security and usability uh, I think is is really important. Um, and obviously that's just on the user end. I think at pretty much every layer of the tech stack, there are tools um, and, you know, developer tools or user tools or whatever that, that are very valuable, but, um, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of them. <laughs> Right. Um, so just turning um, to another question, Nicholas asks, typically for early stage startups, um, uh, with a prototype but no user base, um, how should they be thinking about like investment and equity? So really kind of like that relationship between the founder and the investor as they're kind of developing something for the first time. Um, and I think that 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 decision is um, uh, is, is sometimes uh, is sometimes difficult. So what's your perspective on how founders should be thinking about equity um, and investment um, when they're at the early stages? Um, I can kick this one off. Um, I mean, I think, again, there are um, there are two different ways to think about this, and it kind of depends on whether you are launching a layer one or you're launching sort of like a traditional business. Um, the, you know, conventional wisdom when you're um, fundraising for a conventional business is, um, you know, you want to try to sell as little of your company as possible at each fundraising round. Um, obviously, that means... Uh, you know, trying to be as competitive as possible about valuations as you go out and talk to multiple different investors. Um, ultimately, they will be making that decision. You can propose a price, but um, they're going to send you an offer in terms, and it's up to you to decide whether you want to take that or continue to shop it around or, or whatever else. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, um, as a very general sort of benchmark, um, if you can target selling, you know, maybe between 10 and 15% uh, of the company at, at each round, um, obviously you want to have, you know, a pool of equity set aside for, um, for employees and later hires and all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, fundamentally as the founder of the company, if it's, if, if you have uh, long-term conviction in the business and in the idea, um, then you should be incentivized to hold on to as much of that equity as you possibly can, which means that you should really only be selling as much as you absolutely need um, to raise enough money to get you to the next funding round or the next product milestone or, or whatever else. Um, that paradigm actually is, I think, very different if you are launching a layer one. Um, if you have a bunch of tokens that need to be distributed from the Genesis block, I think it's actually very much in your interest to distribute as many of those as possible before the network goes live. Um, I think uh, the, the truth, especially when we're talking about proof of stake systems, but over a longer time period and proof of work as well, is that a crypto network is 
basically as valuable as um, the number of different people or entities that hold the token. Uh, this is fundamental to a network's security and usability. Um, and I think that like, that's a paradigm that um, a lot of founders have had trouble getting their head around. But ultimately, I think it's more valuable, you know, if as a founder, you end up owning um, 10% of a uh, billion dollar network than it is if you own 40% of a hundred million dollar network, right? So getting those tokens out there, um, especially in those early fundraising rounds, I think is actually quite, quite valuable. Um, so again, the fundraising strategy there um, is going to kind of depend on the kind of business that you're trying to launch and, and what you're trying to accomplish. But I would say those are, you know, very broad strokes. Those are kind of the, the two schools of thought. Yeah, I would agree. I think that in crypto, the mindset of investors has had to adapt somewhat as well, because obviously so much of the value of these networks comes from the decentralization, which is very much a feature and not a bug. And so whereas VCs tend to want to own at least 20%, ideally as much as possible of a company in a traditional scenario, that is extremely rare um, in crypto networks because it's, you know, the, the structure of the networks is somewhat different and you really actually want a broad base of network participants involved and in order to incentivize them to participate and be active community members, obviously having skin in the game is very important. And so I think it's really started to change how both founders and crypto native investors think about ownership targets. Um, and I think you'll see investors in crypto be a lot more flexible about ownership targets than they would be in a traditional scenario, um, you know, as, as Ben mentioned. So definitely agree with him on that. I would say in a typical company scenario, I would, I would bump his numbers a little bit up. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, typically for a series A, you're selling, I often see more like 20 to 25% of the company, um, the seed stage might be a little lower 15 to 20, something like that. Um, I think it really comes down to wanting to sell as little as the comp of, of the company, um, as Ben mentioned as possible, but also making sure that you have the funds to develop whatever it is that you're building, whether that's a network or, or not. Um, I think founders tend to, one thing I commonly see is that founders are a little overly optimistic about um, how far they can stretch a dollar. Um, and while we certainly appreciate the kind of um, positive mindset, um, it's important to build in a little bit of a buffer because unexpected things do arise. And what you really want to avoid, I think, is getting into a scenario where you're having to fundraise every five minutes because at the end of the day, that's a distraction. And as much as, as investors, we love spending time with founders, we also want you to be building the thing that you're raising capital to build. And so if you are having to come back every six to nine months to raise money, that's not ideal. So, um, you know, in, in a typical scenario, I think you would want to raise like two years, at least 18 months of runway, which may then end up coming down a little bit if you do end up having some unexpected um, expenses. But in either case, um, just make sure that you're not having to come back after nine months because it can take a while to put together a, a financing. and. Um, you know, obviously that's true at the seed, but as you go into later rounds, it becomes even more true. Things just take a little bit longer. And so you want to make sure that you have enough time where you're not like down to the wire and, and uh, running out of money as you're trying to close the round, because that's a less than ideal position uh, to be in. Um, agree with everything that was just said. Uh, I'll just sort of add a couple of things. I, I do think, um, structuring rounds is really different if you're building a decentralized platform or application. Um, you know, really thinking with the end in mind, like who, you know, what, what's interesting about tokenized businesses is that the, the line between user and um, investor uh, collapses. Um, and so really with the end in mind, like who are the users of your platform in the end state 
and and think about um, who those investors should be, you know, in the in the early stages or or along the entire way. Like, are they going to be helping you build the product? Are they going to be helping you get developers or users? Are they going to be running nodes or performing important jobs on on the platform or within your within your network? Um, those are a lot of things that um, founders are are thinking about now and and that's what I think is super exciting. The, um, the, the failure mode that I see is a lot of people taking capital from um, folks that you know, don't end up providing value in the near or, or long term. And so really think about like who it is you want in your corner, how they're going to help you, and, and prioritize those folks over others um, is, is what I would say. Definitely. So let's um, let's spend a little bit of time just talking about like process. Um, and I know we have uh, just eight minutes left. So how should um, how should founders approach you? What's that process look like that you think is the most effective to kind of get in touch with your um, respective funds? I'll make it super quick. So we have a, a few. IDEO has a few different ways. Um, the more traditional ways and the less traditional ways. So the traditional ways for us are reach out, you know, on Twitter or uh, via our website, or if you have one of our emails, um, just reach out directly. Um, we also have uh, a number of non-traditional ways. We we actually run a bunch of um, startup programs uh, in sometimes partnership with um, organizations like Cello and others like basically kind of free accelerator programs where we have applications and things like that. So we've run a number of those in the DeFi space over the last two years. Um, we've had about 300 startups go through that process. Um, that's how we like to work with them, even if we don't invest and get to meet them and, and know them. We also recently launched a thing called Fair Launch Capital, if you're planning to do a fair launch. Um, so there's an active Telegram chat around that, and we're working with a couple startups uh, in that capacity as well. So we have a number of kind of programs that we run, um, you know, where people can kind of apply through that that angle, not necessarily for investment, but if that leads to an investment, then that's great. I mean, I always think that uh, a warm intro is best if you can manage it. I think obviously programs like CelloCamp can be awesome in helping facilitate that kind of thing. Um, if that's not possible, I think a thoughtful either cold email or cold Twitter DM, my DMs are open, I do look at them, I don't answer all of them, but I do look at them, um, is a great way to to go about it too. So um, we're, we're out there, I think. Uh, I, I think we make it not terribly easy on purpose because I think the entrepreneurial journey is always a challenging one, no matter how well things go. And so uh, step one is can you get in the room. Um, and in general, I think it's very feasible. View it as a little bit of a fun challenge. And, um, you know, I'm always impressed by the uh, interesting ideas and messages and tactics that people come up with. Don't do anything too weird. But um, I think a warm intro always works, and a, a, a thoughtful, cold message works as a, a second alternative. It's the hustle. <laughs> um, ben, what about your, your, your thoughts there? Um, yeah, I don't have too much else to add except to say, um, to, you know, to sort of build on Ariana's point that um, the space is maturing, it's becoming much more developed, and there are so many resources out there for founders, um, both in terms of uh, like early stage pools of capital, whether it's grant programs um, within specific ecosystems or, um, you know, hackathons that are being sponsored by certain groups or, or um, ecosystem funds like we have at Polychain, or there's a million different accelerators, including, you know, Polychain Genesis, whatever. Um, so there's tons of different avenues and inroads into, um, you know, capital pools in the space. Um, so be creative, explore as many of them as you can. Um, and the one thing that I will add as a sort of uh, piece of practical advice is um, please don't show up empty handed. If you're going to reach out, like you should have at the very least a one pager um, that's sort of professionalized about your company or your idea. Uh, best case, please send us a deck. Um, I am going to speak for myself on this one, but um, I can count on one hand the number of times I have set up a call with somebody without having reviewed some kind of materials first. 
Um, so please bring us something to look at and think about <laughs> and uh, yeah. that'll go a long way. Those are those are all great tips. Um, so we're at um, uh, 8.56. Looks like Rachel just joined us back um, to help us wrap up. Uh, yes, hear me? we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Um, thank you all for joining us today and participating in the event. And a very special thank you to our speakers for joining us in this uh, really insightful and important conversation today. Um, I'd just like to give a quick reminder of upcoming dates for Cello Camp before we say goodbye. Uh, Cello Camp finalists will be announced on October 14. The camp itself will run from October 19 through December 10. Uh, tune in for our idea fair, which is our demo day on December 8. And you'll all be getting invitations for that once we get there. And the winners of Cell Camp will be announced on December 15. Great. Um, and um, also for those of you that are interested in kind of learning more about the Cello Foundation grant programs, A16Z Crypto, Polychain, and IDOVC, I included links in the chat. Um, and then also invite you all to join the conversation um, at uh, chat.cello.org. Um, we have a number of office hours that are open. Um, so for those of you that are interested in kind of learning more about the different programs, including Cello Camp and grants, definitely encourage you to hop on over um, and join the conversation. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Um, and again, special thank you to our speakers. Have a great one. Thank you.